please stand for our national anthem performed by violinist Chelsea Green. Please welcome to the podium Amos Sneed, President of Adferro and National Press Foundation Board Chair. Uh, thank you, Chelsea. Uh, everyone, welcome to the National Shh. Press Foundation's annual awards dinner. Tonight we celebrate the best in journalism, and I would like to introduce our head table and ask that you please hold your applause until the end. So from your left, Sonny Efron, outgoing National Press Foundation President. David Hudson, Vice President of Digital Strategy at the Motion Picture Association and Co-Chair of the NPF Dinner Committee. Ward Sutton, winner of the Berryman Editorial Cartoonist Award. Peter Cherikuri, National Press Foundation Board Member and Founder of Leaderboard Media. Ching Tang Fong, Chief Tech Correspondent at Nikkei Asia and winner of the Heinrich Award for Trade Reporting. Knight Kiplinger, Editor Emeritus at Kiplinger. Scott Simon, host of NPR's Weekend Edition and winner of the W.M. Kiplinger Distinguished Contributions to Journalism Award, and Liz Sidoti, Managing Director at H. Advisors Abernathy and co-chair of the NPF Dinner Committee. And to your right, Moshe Anunu, founder of Mo News, and he's recognized with the Chairman's Citation this evening. Terrence Samuel, NPR's Vice President and Executive Editor and NPF's new Vice Chair. Pierre Thomas, ABC News Senior Justice Correspondent. Robin Roberts of ABC Good Morning America and winner of this year's Tayshoff Award for Excellence in Broadcast Journalism. Krista Bryant of the Christian Science Monitor, winner of the Dirksen Award for Distinguished Reporting of Congress. Time Magazine political correspondent Molly Ball and NPF's new president, Ann Godlasky. Please enjoy your appetizers and the awards will begin in a few minutes. Thank you. Before we kick off the awards, we would like to show you what NPF has done and what it will continue to do with a bright future in mind. And I would like to welcome Ann Godlasky, Ann's unwavering dedication to the field of journalism and her passion for enhancing the skills of fellow journalists make her an exceptional fit for the role of president of the National Press Foundation. We are thrilled to welcome her into this role, and we are eager to collaborate with her to further MPF's mission of making good journalists better. And Thank you, Amos, and thank you to the NPF board, um, and especially to Sunny Efron for her leadership and support uh, the past three years for NPF. Uh, since 1976, the National Press Foundation's model of free, on-the-record training has helped journalists navigate the hottest topics of the day. Um, and this past year has been no exception, from campaign finance to criminal justice, uh, from covering in-depth issues such as racism, aging, 
accountability and privacy. We have trained hundreds of journalists this past year. Journalism for me, and I know for many of the people in this room, has never been just a job. It's been a mission. It has to be when you think about what everyone's facing every day. Even on a night like tonight when we're all celebrating, I know that our thoughts are with Dylan Lyons and the, his family and the Spectrum News team. He was killed because he was there doing, reporting public safety information to his community. Journalists are critical to every community, to a well-functioning society, to a well-functioning democracy. And it is with that in mind that I am so honored to do whatever I can to help the journalists in this room and, and far beyond um, as the National Press Foundation moves forward. And so, um, how we are able to do that best um, is through our awards programs, our fellowships, and our trainings. Um, and for that, I would like to show you just a little bit of what we've been up to. After two years of mostly online meetings, the National Press Foundation jumped into in-person trainings in 2022. Our Paul Miller Washington Reporting Fellows met nine times and toured the Pentagon, Supreme Court, and the White House. In March, we convened 23 State House reporters in Austin, Texas, to learn the latest about redistricting, the Latinx effect on voting, and trends in state legislation. I'm coming away from this uh, four-day session with so many story ideas. Um, in particular, I found the session on model legislation incredibly helpful. Back in Washington, we launched the new Widening the Pipeline year-long fellowship to help journalists of color to rise to leadership positions in American newsrooms. Obviously, what's been missing from the long history of journalism is that uh, not every community got that same treatment and um, we have to work hard to fix it. In July, we traveled to Singapore, where journalists from across Asia joined us to dig deeper into the politics and economics of international trade. They discussed deglobalization with Singapore's most famous undiplomatic diplomat. Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi Jinping, by the way, I think fundamentally do not understand Western systems. The fellows' field trips included a close look at the world's second busiest port. To help journalists cover the fast-changing advances in treating rare diseases, NPF ran training for 25 journalists from every continent and gave them grants to travel and report on some of the diseases that affect so many. In September, journalists in our Living Longer Fellowship were armed with facts and policy analysis to help them produce more accurate portrayals of the issues facing America's aging workers. Two things that aren't in the headlines, but should be age discrimination. Age discrimination, age discrimination. It is so pervasive that we don't even notice it. In November, journalists from around the country who are covering data privacy came to Washington to learn about who's regulating the devices gathering data on the human body whether it's your pacemaker or your smartwatch, who owns that data? The Internet of Bodies is already here, but are we ready for its implications? I definitely gathered a lot of resources for some story ideas I'll take back to the Florida Phoenix. We held special guest Q&As online exclusively for fellows that included speakers such as Dr. Tony Fauci and Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and public webinars on topics ranging from how to cover supply chains to how to trace Russian assets to how journalists can protect their own mental health while covering traumatic stories. In January 2023, NPF partnered with RTDNA for our largest training, bringing 80 television news directors to San Diego to discuss how to go beyond, if it bleeds it leads, in crime coverage. And in McAllen, Texas, near the border, NPF fellows learned about the policies and consequences of crime, COVID, and education spending on the development of our nation's children. The winners, every person who reads or watches the news. 
Thanks for supporting our mission of making good journalists better. And now, please allow me to recognize our small but mighty staff, our Director of Operations, Jason Zaragoza, <laughs> our uh, Director of Journalism Initiatives, R Rachel Jones, <laughs> Director of Digital, Jeff Hertrick, our program manager, Alyssa Black, multimedia journalist, Sydney Clark, and our program assistant, Hope Khan. Your dedication to the journalists that we serve inspires me every day. Thank you. And please now welcome uh, Liz Sidoti and David Hudson, our dinner co-chairs today. First of all, a big thank you and a big congrats to Anne and for her new role. It's well deserved, and we're excited to uh, go forward um, with her at the helm. Um, this is amazing. We have more than 600 people in this room tonight, and um, we want to thank you all because because of you, we've surpassed our 2022 fundraising efforts. And I'd especially like to thank um, our platinum sponsors. Lenovo and uh, Politico for the work. For all of you, um, thank you all for the work that you've done to support the National Press Foundation. David? So we'd also like to recognize the advisory committee members. If you could please stand. Matt Hartwig. Ray Karens. Bill Walsh, Tara DiGiulio, Ed Lewis, Amos Need, Chris Thorne, Robert Winslow, Suzanne Straglinski, Dan Roth, Kenneth Cooper, Jeffrey Smith, and Jennifer Granston. Thank you for helping to make tonight possible. Please welcome to the stage National Press Foundation Vice Chair Terrence Samuel. Hey everyone, you guys are great. All right, let's, let's do this thing. Let's, let's get it started. Um, I am here to present the first award of the evening. It is the National Press Foundation's FETI Award for reporting on the federal impact, the impact of federal policy and regulations on local communities. And your winner is Orion Donovan Smith of the Spokesman Review of Spokane, Washington. Uh, it is for work on the VA's rec record-keeping system and egregious errors and the harm that it did to veterans. Well, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this. Uh, this is a uh, uh, first. I want to. I want to thank my wife, Lori, uh, my editor, John Brunt, and all my colleagues at the Spokesman Review back in Spokane. Uh, who helped make this reporting happen. Thanks to Report for America and the local donors who helped fund my position. Uh, and to the Regional Reporters Association, uh, whose members uh, really uh, showed me the ropes when I started this job a few years ago. Uh, and of course, I want to thank the National Press Foundation. This, this is a special type of honor for me, uh, this award, because it recognizes exactly the kind of reporting my job was created for. 
back in 2020 uh, when we became one of the smallest papers in the country with the DC reporter. I cover the federal government's impact on Spokane and the Inland Northwest region. Uh, and that happens to be the very same area the VA chose uh, as the testing ground for a new electronic health record system. That's a computer system that, that healthcare providers use uh, and rely on for just about every part of their jobs. When a system like that works well, it can uh, reduce medical errors and help people live longer, healthier lives. When it works badly, it can do the opposite. And that's what's happened uh, in Spokane. In 2018, the Trump administration signed a $10 billion sole source contract with a company called Cerner, which has since been acquired by Oracle, uh, to replace the VA's existing system. When the VA launched that new computer system in Spokane uh, and clinics across our region in uh, October 2020, right in the middle of the COVID surge and just before the election, a lot of things went wrong. Now, I can't enumerate all of those, but I would encourage you to read our, our reporting. And, uh, you know, in short, veterans got the wrong prescriptions or they didn't get their meds at all. The computer system routinely crashed. Uh, care was delayed. Uh, and it took VA employees longer to do just about every part of their jobs, which meant caring for fewer patients in a given day. One doctor in Spokane told me recently it has made a difficult job at times impossible and at best miserable. An internal VA safety review found that flaws in the system had caused nearly 150 cases of harm to veterans. But uh, those findings didn't come to light until we reported them more than half a year later. And that was after the system had been launched at four more hospitals and dozens more clinics. When we broke that story, the VA postponed the system's launch at bigger, more complex hospitals where uh, the potential for harm um, would have been amplified, places like Seattle, Portland, Boise. Now, I've been using the, the past tense here, but this is an ongoing story. Uh, the VA has delayed the system's rollout uh, at least until this summer and says it's working with Oracle to fix the problems. But in the meantime, it's still affecting tens of thousands of veterans, uh, not to mention doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers in the Northwest and also now in Ohio. When it comes to the federal government's impact on people's lives, there aren't many actions as consequential as sending Americans to war. And as important as good war reporting is, it's just as essential, I think, that we cover the, the lifelong effects of military service, and that includes uh, how the government takes care of veterans. Research has shown the VA actually provides higher quality care and better outcomes than the private sector, but that requires a good electronic health record system. So that's what's at stake here. This is a complicated story about the type of huge, seemingly boring uh, federal contract that uh, we might take for granted inside the Beltway. But screwing it up has real impact on people's lives across the country. And so uh, it's the kind of story that doesn't always get a lot of attention, the attention it deserves. Uh, and so again, I want to thank MPF for, for recognizing this type of reporting. Thank you. Presenting the Clifford K. and James T. Berryman Award for Editorial Cartoons, David Hudson. Let me just say that I'm thrilled to be able to present this award. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that I am quite often a man of few words. And so I especially appreciate how editorial cartoons, when they are done well, in your case, um, can speak volumes uh, with saying and using very few words, if any at all. And so I would like to congratulate Ward Sutton. Ward has delivered high impact editorial cartoons for the Boston Globe for 15 years. He does an amazing job of harnessing humor but also doesn't shy from the dark side. NPF's judges have called his drawings powerful and full of nuance and complexity. So without further ado, Ward, would love for you to come up here and show them yourself. Congratulations. <laughs> Good evening, fellow members of the Low Life 
elitist, very unfair, <laughs> totally biased, low ratings, enemy of the people. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Many thanks to George Soros, the Deep State, and the Illuminati for allowing us to gather. I'm, uh, I'm incredibly honored and humbled to receive the Berryman Award. Uh, if my luck holds out, I might win it dozens of times. George Santos has. Thank you, uh, thank you to this year's judges, to the National Press Foundation, and to the Berryman family who created this award back in 1989. Coincidentally, 1989 is the year that I graduated from St. Olaf College, where I cut my teeth as a cartoonist for the Manitou Messenger. Tonight, my alma mater is here to help me celebrate. Many thanks, Olies. <laughs> Responsible journalism is a crucial component to our democracy. It's an honor to share the stage with such distinguished journalists. Your dedicated reporting holds leaders to account, keeps us all informed, and I personally depend on it to do my job as a commentator. There's so many talented professionals here tonight, uh, but you probably noticed that one prominent journalist is notably absent. Yes, Tucker Carlson is working hard on an investigation into transgender M&Ms. <laughs> I'm a freelance cartoonist, honored tonight for pieces I've created for the Boston Globe. Thank you, Boston Globe, for valuing and commissioning original cartoons. And thank you, yeah. And thank you, Marjorie Pritchard, the editor I've had the pleasure to work with for 15 years. Now I'd like to take you all through my thought process for creating one of the cartoons I'm being honored for tonight, while sharing some others along the way, starting with this multi-panel cartoon. Gun violence in America, yada, yada, yada. Crazed gunmen, innocent victims, you know the drill, yada, yada, yada. Same story as last time, give or take a few minor details, yada, yada, yada. Never again, our hearts go out, yada, yada, yada. Second Amendment, guns don't kill people, please find enclosed campaign contribution, yada, yada, yada. It's an outrage, read this link, sign this online petition, yada, yada, yada. Yada, yada, yada. I made that cartoon in 2014. I've reposted it many times over the years, and sadly, it's just as relevant each time. With gun violence happening over and over, I drew this cartoon last spring. Groundhog Day, 2022. Then last May came the tragic shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. This mass shooting involved a failed response from the local police department. There was surveillance footage of police officers standing around the halls of the school for over an hour using hand sanitizer, checking their phones while, ch while children were being murdered. When a shooting occurs, calls grow for stronger gun control, and those opposed immediately claim they're just trying to politicize the situation. And we all know who the politicizers are. Democrats. They are just shameless in their opportunism harnessing public demand for change to forge common sense gun regulations that they never seem to be able to pass unless the bills are totally watered down. Republicans, of course, would never stoop to politicizing anything. They're pragmatic, always approaching the bargaining table in good faith, hoping to find consensus. We oppose any form of gun control but we're open to a compromise on keeping flags permanently at half-mast. Certainly the Republican governor of Texas wasn't politicizing when he made this tweet. 
I'm embarrassed. Texas number two in nation for new gun purchases. Behind California. Let's pick up the pace, Texans. With regard to Uvalde, it began to feel as if people were angrier at the police than they were at Salvador Ramos, who actually murdered all those children. I thought it was weird that the MAGA crowd felt this way. They normally seem religiously devoted to never criticizing law enforcement. But then I realized the Uvalde police weren't white guys. I ruminated on this fixation with the police in action, and I was inspired to create this cartoon. Shocking, newly released surveillance video shows Republican lawmakers standing around the halls of Congress doing nothing while children are being shot for 18 years. Like many people, I can get frustrated and discouraged. It can be hard for me to come up with new cartoons on the topic when it keeps happening and nothing happens. But that's the job. It's important for us to remember that even though this news is repetitive, it is not redundant. Each tragedy, each life lost, demands our attention. As I said earlier, responsible journalism is crucial to our democracy, and conversely, democracy is crucial to our free press. On that note, I'll leave you with a single panel from a multi-panel cartoon of mine that imagines what life in the US might be like if democracy were to fail. No more being depressed by the news. No news is good news. I'd like to thank family and friends who are here with me tonight. And a very special thank you to Sue Unkenholtz, my wife, my business partner, and the person who gives me feedback on everything I create. I love you. Thank you all very much. Good night. Presenting the Heinrich Foundation Award for Distinguished Reporting on Trade, NPF board member, Peter Shirukri. Hello, everybody. I'm excited to present the Heinrich Foundation Award uh, for Distinguished Reporting on Trade. This award was created in 2019 to recognize exemplary journalism that illuminates and advances the public's understanding of international business and trade. This year's Heinrich Award goes to Nikkei Asia reporters Zhong Ting Fang and Lao Li Li. In 2021, Chung and Lao Li have been covering Apple's iPhone production challenges in China. Their deep expertise on how the phones are manufactured and where their components are sourced was put to the test when Moscow attacked Kiev on February 24th, 2022. Less than 36 hours later, Zhong and Lali had filed a scoop from Japan revealing that Russia's invasion of Ukraine would jeopardize the global supply of industrial gases that are essential to the production of semiconductors. I also want to recognize the Guardian newspaper Nigeria which won honorable mention for a months-long investigation exposing how herbal products manufactured in Ghana were falsely labeled and marketed as being manufactured in Nigeria. Please join me in congratulating our winners and welcoming Zhong Ting Fang, accepting on behalf of Nikkei Asia. One thing I want to say when I, I got to sit beside Jung just now, there's two things that she told me that I think were really great. One, she's fresh off the plane from London, and then she's headed to Barcelona to cover Mobile World Congress. And two, she was so proud to tell me that this uh, reporting job in Nikkei is her first English language reporting job. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's a great privilege to be here today with so many brilliant journalists. As a non-native English speaker, reporting in English is already very challenging for me. So being here with all of you is something I could never have imagined. That's why I would like to start by expressing my extreme gratitude first to Nikkei they launched this publication, Nikkei Asia, about 10 years ago with the great idea of reporting on Asia and the intersection of global tech, economy, 
geopolitics and business for an English-speaking audience. Nikkei Asia has been nurtured by Nikkei's long-term vision and with the help of its sister publication, The Financial Times, it is growing into an influential voice on Asia. On Asia. Nikkei and the FT have shared their editorial expertise to help advance our growth. And without all these support, Nikkei Asia and journalists like me could never have come this far and produced these quality stories and projects. And second, I want to especially give thanks to Lao Li Li, who is an incredibly talented reporter and who is also recognized in this award. She and I are more than a team. On our own, these stories and many others could not be possible. I also want to thank Jae Won Kim, who is also awarded. He is our expert in South Korea for his great contributions. Loli and Jae Won could not be here in person, but actually they are on the phone, just over there <laughs> on the table. I, I'm not sure if they could hear clearly. And along with some of our Nikkei Asia uh, editors, and I would like to thank the judges at the Henrich Foundation Award and the National Press Foundation for recognizing our reporting on the global chip shortage, as well as the vulnerability of the semiconductor supply chain, even if we do not come from the biggest news outlets. We at Nikkei Asia are indeed a very small team. So small, in fact, that many big US companies often ignore our requests for comments and interviews <laughs> at the beginning. But that does not limit our ambition and it does not stop us from pursuing original and important stories about them for our readers. With this award and your recognition of our journalism, I hope we can work together to plant more seeds that will make journalism in the West and the East more inclusive, more diverse, and to have a wider perspective on the world. Especially at a time of growing tension between the two superpowers in the East and the West. Thank you so much again for giving us this opportunity to be recognized and standing on the global stage. And also, I want to say most of us based in Taipei, uh, like Lao Li and me. So uh, actually, our story are filing out of Taipei instead of Japan. But uh, Nikkei is a Japanese organization. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. Presenting the Saul Tayshoff Award for Excellence in Broadcast Journalism, Pierre Thomas of ABC News. I'd like to have a moment of silence quickly for the journalist who lost his life yesterday uh, before I get started. Uh, they embody so much of what we seek to do and I know what this foundation stands for. So let's have a moment of silence, please. I want to say good evening. It's a privilege to be here to recognize my colleague and dear friend, Robin Roberts, with the Saul Tayshoff Award, which was established in 1983 to honor distinguished service to broadcast journalism. Tonight, the National Press Foundation salutes Robin Roberts' decades of excellence as a broadcast journalist, but also her resilience. Robin has been saying good morning, America, for almost 21 years on America's most watched morning show, Today, she continues to travel the world, pursuing exclusive access to newsmakers and global headlines from the front lines. In the past year alone, Robin traveled to war-stricken Ukraine for an exclusive sit-down with that nation's first lady, Alina Zelenska. She went on an expedition to Africa, where she explored the culture and history of Ghana. And most recently, she traveled to New Zealand to cover the impact of climate change on that country's rapidly melting glaciers. Her range is incredible. From network exclusives with Obama, Michelle Obama back in November to that emotional interview with Brandon Say, the hero who disarmed Monterey Park, California and prevented a second shooting. 
as my dearly departed mom would say, thank the Lord that Robin Roberts' first-rate reporting is on full display every morning on GMA and across the network. Robin and I have worked together at ABC News for more than 20 years. On so many breaking news stories, I've had a front row seat to her exceptional reporting and interview skills. Her great storytelling, her brilliance, and her uncanny ability to connect with those who are in crisis or in triumph. She has the rare ability to bring her iconic presence to her story without overshadowing the story. Everywhere I go, people ask about you, Robin, like you're a family, and by now you are. I remember one point in particular when Robin was um, undergoing treatment, and I would go home and people would literally say, how's she doing? We're praying for her. That's a true testament to who you are. And beyond her reporting, Robin, as she would say, she has made her mess her message, opening up about her own health challenges in the hope of inspiring others. Just this week, she marked the 10-year anniversary of returning to GMA after her own life-saving transplant with another nationwide bone marrow drive. Thanks to Robin's efforts and GMA viewers over the years, tens of thousands more registered donors have been added to the National Registry, and 140 have gone on to receive life-saving bone marrow donations. <laughs> Robin's career is nothing short of awe-inspiring, and our craft, broadcast journalism, is better for it. I know I speak for ABC News President Kim Godwin and all my colleagues at ABC News when I say, Robin, you're someone we admire, someone we respect, and who we truly love. You inspire excellence among all who work alongside you. You're a shining example of why we want to be at ABC News. Robin, a secret. Every time you introduce me, I am so proud. Pardon my language, I'm like, damn, that's Robin Roberts. <laughs> Mom, forgive me. Tonight, celebrating her excellence and in journalism and her resilience, we celebrate the impact she's had along the way. Now, let's take a look at a video narrated by my colleague and previous recipient of the Saul Tayshoff Award, ABC News Chief Global Affairs Anchor and Correspondent Martha Raddatz. Martha is on assignment and could not be here tonight, but she's with us in spirit. Let's take a look at this piece as we celebrate Robert. And a good Friday morning to everyone, and as always, have so much to get to. For over three decades, ABC News' Robin Roberts has been a fixture on screen. It has been a very, very tense and anxious morning. Along the seven-mile stretch of beach, not one home or business remained. We're about 45 feet or so above the Atlantic Ocean. The area just, just west of here has been known as the toughest place in Iraq. As a trusted voice, Robin on the scene for breaking news. We loved you, ma'am. Our hearts are broken. One simply said thank you. It was a life of service, duty, and grace. Today marks the final farewell to Her Majesty and the end of the second Elizabethan age, a remarkable era. We're joined exclusively now by Brandon Shea, who wrestled the gun away from the shooter at the second dance hall. I needed to get the weapon away from him. I needed to take this weapon, disarm him, or else everybody would have died. Robin traveling to Ukraine for a broadcast exclusive interview with First Lady Olena Zelenska. That's an air sign right now. As Zelenska urged continued support from the U.S. Like I've already said, we really feel the support of the American people, the people, the people. This is probably the most pleasant in this situation, when you're not alone. Robin, helping to shine a light on the realities of a war-torn region. As we got closer and closer, we saw, we saw the true destruction. People need to know this isn't what you see all around this country. Through the years, our nation's top leaders choosing to talk to Robin at pivotal moments. Mr. President, are you still opposed to same-sex marriage? I've been going through an evolution on this issue. For me personally, it is important for me to go ahead and affirm 
that uh, I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. You are the 20th Democrat <laughs> to announce for president. What differentiates you from the other 19? If you unite the country, and that's what we're going to be talking a lot about. What is going to be going through your mind when you take that oath of office? As I said recently, I will be the first, uh, but I will not be the last. Safety Robin, there for our country's Greiner. most gripping stories. And, and I know that Secretary Blinken has reached out to you and has communicated to you that top priority. Do you feel that's the case? You say she's top priority, but I want to see it. And I feel like to see it would be me seeing BG on U.S. soil. You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How did that present itself? It was that loss of hope, you know, thinking about, did all of this matter? Close to her heart, the survivors of Hurricane Katrina. Robin, I know when you left here last night and flew down, you hadn't been able to make contact with your own family yet. Have you done so? They're okay. They're okay? A million and a half Haitians are displaced. And she was there after the devastating earthquake in Haiti. Everywhere you look, such destruction, such devastation. It's in sharing her own story. It is something that is called MDS. Through two battles with cancer and a bone marrow transplant. I have been waiting 174 days to say this. Good morning, America. Robin, opening the door for others and helping save lives. And so many of our viewers are signed up to be part oh, of the registry. Yeah. What kind of numbers do we have? I'm telling you, we went to the Be The Match to get the numbers, and they're astounding. More than 26,000, 26,000 of you have signed up for the registry. 140 people have gone on to donate. That gave 140 people a second chance at life. Whether on the scene or at the desk, Robin shows up with heart, humor, and humility. Robin Roberts. Nobody else had to endure a video showing their hairstyles and <laughs> different attire over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Pierre Thomas, bless your pea picking heart. I tell you what. It doesn't matter if it's Good Morning America, World News, Nightline, Sunday mornings, your reporting elevates every broadcast that you are a part of. I thank my, I, I did not see that video and I thank my ABC family for, for putting that together. It means so much to me. The National Press Foundation, thank you. Thank you so much for this honor and I know what you mean when you say make good journalists better. I live that every day because of these two tables. I want them to stand from ABC News that are here. They make me, please stand, don't be, don't be shy now. John Carl and everyone, the two ABC tables. You make me a better journalist each and every one of you, and I thank you. I thank you for being here. Our, our fearless leader, our president, Kim Godwin, the last to sit down because she wanted more attention. No, no, hey, I love you, Kim. Love you, nothing but hey. But I have to say, her first day on the job, Kim Godwin, the first day on the job, she talked about the three C's of leadership. She talked about how she had the confidence to do the job. She had the courage as a leader to make tough decisions, and she was going to provide clarity. Kim Godwin, you have done that and more, and I appreciate your leadership each and every day. It was so difficult to wake up this morning, and that was so you, Pierre, to have that moment of silence. It was difficult to report this morning another shooting, the loss of a nine-year-old and one of our beloved colleagues, Dylan Lyons, 24 years old. We know of the dangers of reporting from a war zone, but we were reminded that the danger 
is everywhere. Tomorrow will mark one year, one year since Russia invaded Ukraine, one year. And our team has been there from the beginning, and many of the tables here, you've had teams that have been there as well. And it's up to us as, as journalists to provide context, the truth, and to also be able to relate the stories from there. And that's why, in part, I traveled to Ukraine last year. Yes, to speak with First Lady Elena Zelenska, but also to give the ABC News team there a big old hug and to help them share what it's like to be there in a war zone covering that story day in and day out, away from their families, being able to help them. And when I spoke with Elena, Celeste, uh, Elena Zelenska, I asked her, what is her message to the American people? And she first and foremost said, thank you. And remember, at that time, there were a lot of Ukrainian flags that were flying in yards, and there was a lot of, a lot of support. And she said to me, please tell the American people, do not get used to our pain. And I'm reminded of that, because tonight, as we mark a year of that coverage, and we mark, what, three years of coming out of COVID and the pandemic, that not to get used to the pain, not to get used to the war, and it's so important that we, that we know that this too shall pass. This was a very special week for me, as was alluded to. It marked 10 years since I was able to return to the anchor decks at GMA. It was a moment that I wasn't sure ever would happen. Man. I was wondering if y'all were going to applause. I mean, a 10 year, come on, man. That was, well, I, you should have seen me. I was barely 100 pounds and a little, little, had two hairs on my head. When it was brought to my attention that we were going to mark that milestone, it was our executive producer who's here, Simone Swink, who said, you know, Robin, let's, let's amplify what we've been doing these past 10 years. Let's help you continue to make your mess your message. And so, she was the one who came up with the idea of a nationwide bone marrow registry. And she put my senior, Ebony Griffin, who's here as well, has a daughter at Howard. She had to pay her some money today because she was there, you know, a college student. She was glad to see her mama, but she was like, had her hand out. She had to grease that palm. But Ebony, she rallied the troops. And our coverage has been something that we have been able to make one match give someone a second chance. We added, just through the registry this past couple of weeks, we've been able to add to what you've seen the number. 8,000 more have registered on the Bone Mary Registry. And, you know, that's what we do as, as journalists. That's what we do. And I, I remember my dear, my dear friend and colleague, Diane Sawyer, who said, you know what, let's have stories that cause a reaction that leads to action. And that's what we do. And I just want to say I'm so proud to be by all of you here. All the, you were funny, man. I mean, you did, man, damn. I'm so glad I didn't have to follow you. You were hard enough to follow. I thought I was going to still have that podium up here. I'd been six, you know, I've been seven feet tall. But I'm so proud to be with each and every one of you, and I congratulate you all. And I'm sorry that I won't be able to stay with you, and I'm really sorry that I got, can't go to that political after party, because that was going to be a rager. But blessings to all, and thank you very much for this honor. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed your dinner, and please welcome back to the podium, Amos Sneed. Hey, everyone. Uh, before we get on to the rest of tonight's awards, we would like to pause for a moment to recognize the incredible contributions that our outgoing president, Sonny Efron, has made to the National Press Foundations over the past three years. Sonny has been everything we could have wanted. She's energetic, she's collaborative, innovative, and nimble. From the perspective of a board member, Sonny has been responsive and communicative and always made me feel the ship was in good hands. Thank you, Sonny. I'll miss you. Sonny Efron, National Press Foundation's new president and chief Sonny became president of the National Press Foundation just at the start of the pandemic. So the job that she signed up for was very different from the one that she had to do. 
NPF has had many in-person programs through the years. But at the time she took over, everything had to be moved to Zoom and to be done remotely. She worked closely with our funders and sponsors who agreed to this change in the way that we did things. So, Sunny, I am very sorry to see you go. I think you did a splendid job, and I wish you very good luck in the next endeavor that you take on. I was an editor at the Los Angeles Times. Her name was given to me as somebody who was really ready for a, a, another step. And we were building up a larger bureau in Moscow. So we sent her to Moscow. In the summer of 95, Chechen nationalists, they hit a number of buildings and then they settled on taking over a hospital and they proceeded to be a multi-day siege. It was a tense time and Sonny was down there on the scene. Sonny made the virtual trainings and events a success. She broadened our donor base and she recruited a super talented staff that puts us in the strongest possible shape for whatever comes next. I've been in awe of Sunny for many, many years, from her coverage of Putin's war in Chechnya to running the LA Times Bureau in Tokyo, from making the Times' op-ed operation one of the most vital and readable in the country, uh, to taking on senior leadership roles at the State Department, Human Rights First and the RAND Corporation, and to her partnership with Paul in raising three brilliant, wonderful children. We're going to miss Sunny at the MPF, but I am so grateful for all she has done and for her commitment to making better journalists of us all. Wow, way to make me cry right before I have to give remarks. Thank you, everybody. I want to thank all of you who bought tables here. Um, and I want to thank all of you who supported NPF um, and me during the pandemic uh, in the dark days when we literally couldn't uh, train journalists in person and we were trying to figure out how to work Zoom and we didn't even know how to record Zoom. Um, so thank you to the board, Amos, um, John, and all of the board. Um, I really want to thank you. And uh, just so that you know, um, you know, this does go to a good cause of making good journalists great. As you know, NPF is about encouraging excellence. That's what our awards are about. Um, but we also want to celebrate excellence, and we want to encourage re really excellent reporting about the things that matter, the issues that really matter. And so looking around the ballroom, I think it'll shock you to know that um, the US population is getting older. Um, and so I'm really thrilled to announce the creation of a brand new award the AARP Award for Excellence on Journalism in Aging. So this award will um, encourage journalists to focus on the challenges and opportunities for people and society in the face of this really massive demographic change that our country is going through and the world. And this will carry two $5,000 prizes for large as well as small media because we want to make sure that this is covered broadly across the media environment. And um, I want to thank AARP and particularly I want to thank uh, AARP's Chief Communication and Marketing Officer, Martha Boudreau. Martha, could you stand up? Um, Mar Martha helped to make this happen, but she's also a former board member of the National Press Foundation. She's been a dinner committee chairman. She's been behind this organization for many years. And I want to thank you so much for your confidence in, uh, in NPF and for all the work that I hope we will do together. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny, and I also want to thank Sunny for all of your work towards this AARP Gold and this brand new award. And now we'd like to continue with this year's awards, and I'm honored to present the next one. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Moshe Anunu, a distinguished and accomplished executive producer with a remarkable career spanning over two decades in broadcast media. His work has earned him numerous prestigious accolades, including the Emmy, the Murrow, and Webby Awards. Today, Moshe stands at the helm of Mo News, where his team blends extensive experience working with some of the most prominent news teams around the media landscape 
with real-time updates from across the globe. He's made it a mission to offer daily news updates on a variety of platforms while remaining steadfast in his dedication to accurate and fair journalism, which is a vital service to an audience that seeks out trusted news sources. So it's my great honor to present Moshe with this National Press Foundation Chairman Citation in recognition of your outstanding contributions to the field of journalism. But before we do that, I understand we do have a video. I'm fascinated with this basically experiment, this news experiment that you've conducted on Instagram. You're kind of like this news concierge, you've been called. And I read that you said you really wanted to take this, this straightforward approach with your followers. And basically, people, people want to see what's happening in the news, maybe see stuff that questions their own assumptions about things. And you really found that there was an audience for that. I hear from people teachers telling me about what's happening in their classrooms, farmers about how climate's impacting their fields, first responders about what's happening in their hospitals. I post their messages, how they're reacting to the headlines. They're looking for a conversation with the reporters and the journalists who are covering the news. They're looking to be heard. Amos, thank you. Thank you to the National Press Foundation uh, for this honor. I'm so grateful for the support for what we are doing at Mo News. It's a privilege to sit in a room full of journalistic legends tonight. Um, I should say there, is an, there are a number of mel mentors of mine in this room. I actually got my start, my first internship at ABC News in the Washington Bureau, uh, working uh, at this week at the time with Sam, Koki, and George. So it's great to... Thank you for all the insight, advice along the way. I'm also thankful to my dear family, friends, colleagues, Jill, the whole team at Mo News, including uh, my parents are in the room tonight. They came in from Chicago. And, and, and I will say this, they, they got a sense early of uh, my fascination with news. Uh, they had a six-year-old on their hands who they would hand a quarter to to buy ice cream downstairs at a Baskin Robbins in Morton Grove, Illinois. And I came back with a copy of the Chicago Tribune. <laughs> Sometimes you know very early on. I also want to thank my wife, Alex, who's in the room, with who, without whom this would not be possible. After a career in traditional media at places like Fox and Bloomberg and, and CBS, I was very fearful, nervous to go out on my own, start something from scratch. But Alex, your encouragement, your confidence gave me confidence, gave me courage, and uh, helped make this a reality. So thank you, I love you. And I just wanna tell everyone, listen to your wife. <laughs> listen to your wife, listen to your spouse, they're right. Because <laughs> it turns out this started during quarantine and it was an exercise for just a couple weeks. We were all stuck at home, I was stuck at home, and it was the first time in my life I was not in a newsroom during a big story and I sort of freaked out. I needed information sources and the only way I could process a major news event was through reporting the news event. So at that moment, my biggest platform was Instagram and a couple hundred friends and family <clears throat> on a private account. And so I took there to explain COVID headlines and break things down and Alex, my wife, who's right, said, you should take this public. This is a thing. There are new ways of processing information and news. And so a couple hundred became thousands, became tens of thousands, became millions now on a weekly basis who are getting news from Instagram, from our daily podcast, from our daily newsletter. Our priority at Mo News is to break down the headlines in a nonpartisan manner, in a conversational way, keep it understandable, keep the analysis nonpartisan and balanced. And our goal is to reach new platforms where people are looking for content, looking to engage, looking for their news and information these days, and most importantly, engage them, engage the audience, answer their questions. They're looking for a genuine dialogue these days with the journalists who cover the news. They're looking for more from their politicians. They're looking more for the, uh, from the companies that they buy things from, and they're looking for more from us. And so it comes at a crucial time, this challenge, we know that authoritarianism is on the rise. We know that democracy is on the defense. We know what's key to democracy is a free press, is a free, sustainable press, a healthy press. And so we need to adapt to new technologies, to the new ways people are consuming information to maintain and grow audience trust. 
We all know it's a challenging time to do that. We're attacked from all sides. And we're also trying to figure out a business model that works for all of us on these new platforms. And I'm honored to be in a room tonight of the best and brightest. And I know you all will figure that out. We will figure it out together. It's an honor to receive this award tonight from the National Press Foundation, an organization that is focused on raising funds for journalism scholarships, on training the next generation, and training the existing generations on how to adapt to what's going on. One major supporter of this foundation and a former uh, a mentor of mine that we lost this year, some of you may know him, Bill Plant, was a longtime CBS White House correspondent. He was, a, he was a mentor for me, also a Chicago guy, came out of Chicago back in the day. And he said at his retirement a few years ago that the platforms that we report things on will continue to change. But one thing doesn't, great storytelling, holding power to account, giving voice to the voiceless, investigative reporting. We'll keep doing that no matter what platform we're doing it on. All your work tonight is so important. It is an honor to be in this room tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am thrilled to announce this next award. NPF's Innovative Storytelling Award recognizes digital journalism that reinvents the way stories are told. USA Today's project, which you'll see here in a minute, used hierarchical clustering to analyze political linguistics. That's a mouthful, but it's important because as Yif, Yif Lelkis of UPenn says in the story, lawmakers' language makes people see the world as much more polarized and treacherous than it actually is, which then is self-fulfilling. On a personal note, I'd like to add that this year's winners are not only brilliant and creative, but kind and collaborative. Congratulations to Ali Shubayak and Ramon Padilla. Well, <clears throat> Ramon cannot be here tonight. I'm Javier Zarracina, the graphics editor of the USA Today. But he sends a message of gratitude. He is really humble and honored to be included among this list of impressive journalists. Thanks to the, to the National Press Foundation for this award and the essential work you do. The USA Today graphics team worked very closely with Aletsu and the data team to create uh, visualizations to make these, ana these big analyses compelling and understandable for the audience in all platforms. As every interactive, uh, this project incorporated many skills from within our team, including Veronica Bravo, who are directed this series, Michelle Thorson, who implemented the user interface, and also the smart editing from Sean Sullivan and Jean Sargent. But the leading forces behind the project were Ramon and Alecho. So, Alecho. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so thanks to the National Press Foundation, obviously, for just the amazing work that they do. And I have to thank Ramon for his grace and grit on this project and so many others that we collaborated on. And thanks to Steve Suo, um, can't be here, but our, probably the hardest working editor I know. Uh, and mil gracias, por supuesto, uh, Javier Sarracina. Um, I'm always thinking, what would Javier do in this situation? So this project is a culmination of many years exploring the language of our politics and trying to map out linguistic assaults that were happening before our faces, right? Reshaping politics into this moral battle, right? Words matter, and I wanted to find the tools to understand those words, right? So this story involves almost three million tweets from hundreds of legislators over 10 years, right? And so with all of that, we wanted to show something. And what we ended up showing and proving with science was that the language had become more polarized, that it had become more antagonistic, and it had become more uncivil, right? So I have to thank my very patient and generous collaborators on this, which were academics, academics who guided me in a journalist in residence program at the university, or at the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna as well as the labs of Northeastern, MIT, University of Zurich, TU Graz in Austria. You know, these, these folks were very generous and journalism needs to forge stronger ties with those academic researchers. 
And we need more experimentation in the newsroom. So I have to thank Steve, of course, this sandbox that he created in addition to Chris Davis, Nicole Carroll, Amy Pyle, and many others at USA Today. Our project borrowed, as you can see, from computational social science and natural language processing, right? The stuff that's kind of behind ChatGPT and stuff, right? And applied it to the work of politics and understanding political speech, right? But anyone could have done this from this little corner of journalism where exhaustive data collection and clever data science collide. And it's a very small and really nerdy corner. But with, mass, with misinformation and bad data spreading, we need more journalists applying the scientific method to their work. Enough of the single anecdote, the single expert, the single study story. Let's reinforce journalists who can tackle ambitious analytical work in the public interest. Thank you. Please welcome to the podium the 2020 winner of the Everett McKinley Dirksen Award for Distinguished Reporting of Congress, Molly Ball. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, I hate to break it to you, though I feel like Ward kind of spook scooped me on this one, but uh, many Americans see Congress as an out-of-touch, elitist institution. Rather than getting defensive or trying to disprove this fact, Krista Case Bryant set out to examine the possible reasons for it, the lack of diversity among the staff who run the place. Bryant's nuanced article in the Christian Science Monitor drew on interviews with policymakers and staff at all levels to show not only the dimensions of the problem, but its root causes and possible solutions. The result was a vivid human portrait that took readers inside the inner workings of government. Judge Terrence Samuel of NPR praised her work as the story that nobody else could do. Bryant's winning entry also included a deeply reported piece on how staffers who worked on the Watergate hearings viewed the January 6th hearings, bringing historical insight from those who lived it to a very newsy topic. It's my honor to present Krista Case Bryant with this year's Everett McKinley Dirksen Award for Distinguished Reporting of Congress. Thank you, Molly. And what Molly didn't tell you is that she's the 2020 winner of the Dirksen Award, and they did it by Zoom that year. So let's all give Molly a very belated <laughs> round of applause. It's really special to be with all of you here tonight celebrating the vital role of journalism in American democracy. And I'm also really grateful to have my family with me here, my husband, who have been just such an unfailing support for me. And I want to give special gratitude tonight to my broader Monitor family. The Christian Science Monitor was founded in an era of yellow journalism by Mary Baker Eddy, who gave it a radically different mission, to injure no man, but to bless all mankind. I learned more about that mission while attending Principia College, which, like St. Olaf, is here joining in the celebration tonight. <laughs> At the time, our new college president, George Moffat, had been a former Monitor Jerusalem bureau chief, and I loved listening to his stories of covering the Middle East, including a midnight rendezvous with Yasser Arafat in Tunis, and weekly meetings with an upstart junior Israeli official named Bibi Netanyahu. A decade later, the Monitor sent me to Jerusalem, which was amazing and surprisingly good preparation for covering US politics. <laughs> On my third day as our new congressional correspondent, rioters shattered windows and doors and broke into the Capitol. I don't think January 6 was exactly what my predecessor, Gail Russell Chaddock, had in mind when she would always tell me, this is the best job in Washington. If you ever have a chance to do it, take it. But she had also given me a sense that the halls of Congress are not for the faint of heart. She told me about John McCain, Senator John McCain, once pointing out to her his favorite painting in the Capitol, which is the Battle of Lake Erie. And Gail assumed that McCain saw in himself or saw himself in the heroic naval officer who's right at the center of the painting, leading his men to this incredibly unlikely victory. No, said McCain, who was in the middle of brokering a difficult bipartisan compromise. 
It's the drowning man off to the side who resonates with me. That might be something the namesake of this award, Senator Dirksen, could relate to. In his 34 years in Congress, he spent only four of them in the majority as a Republican. The other 30, he was in the minority. And yet, coming from a really poor background, delivering milk barefoot in his neighborhood, he rose to become one of the most influential senators of his time. So I pass that painting of the Battle of Lake Erie often. It's right at the top of this grand marble staircase going up to the Senate Press Gallery. And sometimes I too feel like I'm struggling to keep my head above water in these tumultuous times. But what has really kept me buoyed is the mission of the Christian Science Monitor and the support of my colleagues, including those here tonight, our editor, Mark Sappenfield, managing editor, Amelia Newcomb, and our Washington bureau chief, Linda Feldman. And I also want to give special thanks to my immediate predecessor, Francine Kiefer, who couldn't be here tonight, but has done so much to prepare the way for me to cover Congress. So it's thanks to that mission and support that I had the opportunity to go beyond the daily headlines and do some of these deeper stories that Molly is talking about. This award means so much, not only to me, but to our whole newsroom. So on behalf of my colleagues, I sincerely thank the National Press Foundation for recognizing the value of Christian Science Monitor journalism. Thank you so much. To introduce the uh, Editor of the Year Award, please welcome Nicole Carroll, Editor-in-Chief of USA Today. Editors make tough calls every day. Some are harder than others. And a few, those that make us confront the very worst of humanity, they shake your soul. Manny Garcia, editor of the Austin American Statesman, was listening to the TV in May when reports emerged that a gunman had entered Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. For 77 minutes, law enforcement gathered in the school hallways, fully armed, fully shielded, while inside the classroom, terrified children called 911. Agents finally stormed the room, and they said they killed the gunman. By then, he had fatally shot 19 fourth graders and two teachers. No one can know for certain how many lives would have been saved if police had acted sooner. Texas DPS praised the officer's heroism. The Texas governor said officers ran toward gunfire to save lives. Of course, this wasn't true. And when the media demanded records and answers, requests were delayed or rejected. The community lost trust in the authorities and their versions of events. Yet Uvalde and America shouldn't have had to pick among unreliable narratives. And they wouldn't have to, thanks to the Austin American statesman. There was a hallway camera in Robb Elementary, and statesman reporter Tony Plohetsky got the video on a Sunday night in July and immediately called Manny and others. I knew what we had, Manny told me. Regardless of whether you're a parent or not, it just impacts you in your soul. Manny would publish the video, but carefully and thoughtfully. Plohetsky, he described to me the conversation. Are we going to show the gunman walking in? Why or why not? Are we going to air the gunfire, the screams? Are we going to air them? I think when you are actively debating whether or not you're going to publish the sound of children screaming in a school, I just can't think of a more daunting decision. The statesmen left the gunfire in the video. They removed the sound of the children. They did not show any victims. Manny knew the video would cause more pain to the families, and for that he was sorry. But he also knew the public had a right to know what happened, and the truth could save lives by showing the massive mistakes made that day. Two weeks later, when a Texas House committee released its shooting report, it was available initially only in English to a heavily Spanish-speaking community. Manny knew we could do better and got the entire report translated. Then he and others drove a little over three hours to Uvalde to personally deliver Spanish language copies of the report to stores, churches, and the police department. They also left a stack at Robb Elementary. To this day, Texas officials still refuse to release the public records. Thank goodness we have determined journalists. A coalition of media companies, including Gannett, which owns the statesman, has filed a lawsuit against Texas DPS demanding the release of the records. A hearing is set for March 8th. 
Manny will be there. Journalists cover stuff, tough stories every day. Some are harder than others, and some will shake your soul. For those, thank goodness for local newsrooms like the Austin American Statesman, and for principled, compassionate editors like Manny Garcia, the Benjamin C. Bradley Editor of the Year. Good evening. So, Yavalde, our coverage is also, it's a labor of love and tears. So, once again, good evening, buenas noches. I'm honored to join you tonight. I want to thank the National Press Foundation for the Benjamin C. Bradley Editor of the Year Award. 33 years ago, I started my journalism career listening to a police scanner, and here we are. I want to recognize some of my friends, family, and coworkers who would join me tonight. Amelie Nash, Senior Vice President for Local News, USA Today Network, who nominated me. Maribel Perez-Wadsworth, my friend and former president of Gannett Media and publisher of USA Today. Thank you both for trusting me in 2021 to come and lead the statesman. My Zell Stewart III, my former boss and now CEO of Emerging Leaders, you have modeled the way as a leader for me. To my beautiful daughter, Madison, who's my rock, and my lovely wife, Elizabeth, and lastly, for God for this journey. So let me share that Yuvali is one of the greatest failures in law enforcement history. As Nicole was saying, on May 24th, a troubled teenager armed with an assault rifle walked into Robb Elementary. He killed 19 fourth graders and their two teachers. Almost immediately, from the Secretary of Homeland Security to the Texas governor, including federal, state, and local authorities, spun a narrative of police heroics and bravery, except it wasn't true. That false narrative began to crumble because reporters never let up. Authorities acknowledged mistakes. The governor said he was misled, but still no one took ownership. No one could truly fathom the level of failure. That is until my colleague, statesman investigative reporter, Tony Plahetsky, obtained the security footage it was shocking, heartbreaking, hard to watch. Our managing editor, Courtney Sebesta, who's here with us tonight too, worked with Tony and together with the leadership at USA Today, we created a slow and deliberative process to understand the gravity and know of what we had obtained. And thus, we began navigating what I call as ethical and editorial decisions stacked upon one after the other. So they range from the decision to leave out the screams of children one of the most haunting moments of our careers. The decision to, live in, to leave in the sound of gunfire, important because 48 minutes into the footage, the gunman resumes shooting in the classroom. Still, no officers storm inside. The decision to publish the entire video, including the 77-minute delay by law enforcement to end the siege, with our local news partner, KVU. A decision we made in hopes of tamping conspiracy theorists who claim mass shootings are staged. We knew the impact of families who had lost children. We were balancing that against exposing how scores of heavily armed officers who swore an oath to protect and serve stood around. The response to publication was immediate. We were criticized by many, including many of the Uvalde families who were hurting. We, we also received death threats some hope my children would be killed too. We were lauded also for being transparent with our decision making. I heard from readers, including current and former law enforcement officers, who thanked us for exposing this extraordinary failure. Publishing our work was also critical because the state had created a special legislative committee to investigate this very tragedy. Much of its work was conducted in secrecy. A group of Texas legislators also digging into the response, even signed non-disclosure agreements to review investigative files. So think about that for a moment. One of the greatest tragedies that happened, non-disclosure agreements were signed. Uvalde's majority Hispanic, a language other than English is spoken in more than 53% of homes. When a special legislative committee I just mentioned released its final report, it was not in Spanish. 
despite Uvalde being, despite Uvalde families asking for the report in Spanish. The committee said it would be translated and ready in the coming weeks. The mayor of Uvalde said two weeks. Again, simply not true. That's when what I call the United Nations of Journalism jumped in into action. So this Cuban journalist texted a Venezuelan journalist, Teresa Frontado, my former managing editor at El Nuevo Herald, who's here too. She's a translator you trust with such an endeavor. We teamed up with a Cuban Basque journalist, Romina Ruiz from USA Today, who pinged a copy at her friend Sonia, who's in Mexico City, and the work began. A cadre of bilingual journalists across USA Today, our USA Today network, worked throughout the night to finish the translation, including every footnote. We finished in three days. Stupid me, I planned to print several hundred copies at a local printer. That's when Nicole Carroll said, Manny, we own printing presses. <laughs> right? <laughs> so 10,000 copies later, two pallets of new newspapers arrived in Uvalde. Our statesman team personally delivered them to those who needed them. A true public service. I've never been prouder to be a journalist and part of the statesman family in this organization. Finally, I got to close that my career would not be possible if not for the bra my brave grandparents and parents. They made the brave decision when I was an infant to flee communist Cuba. There isn't a day that I don't think about their sacrifice, and this award is for them. Again, thank you to the Nes National Press Foundation for this honor. Thank you. Welcome to the podium, Knight Kiplinger. I'd like to tell you a few things about Scott Simon. He has had a very interesting life. After high school in Chicago, he attended three prestigious universities, one at a time, but didn't graduate. His first real job was at a group home for adults with cognitive disabilities which perhaps deepened his innate compassion for people who are different. He started his journalism career not at an establishment mainstream media outlet, but on the counterculture fringe, writing for a kind of sketchy underground newspaper in Chicago. He freelanced for the local NPR station and at 25 became NPR's first bureau chief in Chicago, a bureau of one. The rest, as they say, is history. Today, on every Saturday morning, some four million Americans start their weekend with the friendly, folksy, but authoritative voice of Scott Simon who has hosted Weekend Edition Saturday since 1985, when he was all of 33 years old. We've heard several, yes, indeed. What a run. <laughs> you can do the math on his age. He's a, he's a few years younger than I am. He's very, very young. Now. Well, we've heard several times tonight, and it's absolutely true, that the essence of great journalism is storytelling. And Scott Simon is an extraordinary storyteller. Maybe because there are two great storytelling traditions in his parental genes, Jewish and Irish. Scott tells stories of real life, of tragedy, joy, love, perseverance. His weekly commentaries on a topic in the news that week for which he won a Peabody Award are little gems of insight, compassion, wisdom, and usually humor, indeed whimsy. Even when he is clearly critical and disapproving Scott Simon displays unwavering decency and fairness, 
traits in short supply in much of commentary today. But Scott Simon is so much more than a radio news host. Most notably, he is an author of distinction. Of nine highly acclaimed books, novels, family memoirs, nonfiction works for adults and for teens, a book about his unforgettable mother, a book about Jackie Robinson, a book about a young woman in wartime Sarajevo, a book about he and his wife adopting two baby girls from China. A book about his beloved Chicago Cubs. Yes, an entire book. <laughs> his latest book is the highly improbable, kind of bizarre, but true story of a big band of German jazz musicians that the Nazis created in World War II to broadcast popular swing music laced with the changed lyrics of Nazi propaganda to audiences in Europe and the United States. Scott has titled this upcoming book, with apologies to Mel Brooks, Swing Time for Hitler. <laughs> the W.M. Kiplinger Award for Lifetime Achievement, now in its 40th year, has honored many giants of American journalism and it's a very eclectic group. Unique talents, Seymour Hirsch, George Will, Judy Woodruff, Frank DeFord, Bob Woodward, Robert Siegel, Ben Bradley, Clarence Page, Diane Rehm, Carl Rogan, Rowan, Paul Steiger, and many more. Tonight's honoree belongs in this pantheon. The man for whom the award is named, W.M. Kiplinger, was a plain-speaking, clear-writing Midwesterner, a native son of Ohio. Despite 50 years in Washington as an influential and highly successful journalist and publisher, he never got fancy or put on airs. He would be pleased that we're honoring this evening a man who, despite his almost four decades inside the Beltway, remains a clear-thinking, plain-speaking, native son of Chicago. Please welcome Scott Simon. You know, Scott is the ultimate everything in reporting, hosting, journalism. He's a fabulous writer. He is a persistent interviewer. And he's a reporter who never accepts a non-answer. Uh, Scott really, really pays attention to all of the details while sort of taking in the bigger picture. But I think it's also important to present to the public the face, or in Scott's case, more often the voice, of somebody who represents the best of what actual journalism is. Working with Scott uh, day in and day out, I've learned a number of things from him, but I think most significantly, uh, two things that I've taken away from him are humility uh, and also rigor. In terms of humility, Scott's the kind of guy who can talk to anybody, anywhere, at any time. In terms of rigor, whenever you go to pick something to Scott, he applies a very, very heavy and much needed um, editorial pressure. Uh, whenever you're going to say something, you have to be prepared for a thousand questions. Who is this? Why is this important? Why should we do this? Why does the audience need to hear this? Always sort of keeping in mind, what is the takeaway for everything that we do? Um, and if I were to think about what Scott specifically inspired me to do, Scott has an amazing ability to be present as a person in an interview or in any kind of reporting without in any way stealing the spotlight. Week in and week out, he produces essays. Sometimes they're very light, even funny, and sometimes they're very serious and profound and represent all of us in some profound way.
Jeff Brickhouse to say. Uh, Thank you very much. It's uh, a particular honor to be honored with so many. I'm, I'm taking a look here through my remarks, which are in. By the way, I'm going to be the last person up tonight, so you might want to start calling Uber right now. <laughs> Everybody just left theirs on top. Can you imagine? They left some of the most interesting stuff out of here, by the way. I, I don't think I'd ever heard that story. Um, in any event, I, I, I too want to begin by noting um, that we hold hearts in our thought tonight for the family of Dylan Lyons, uh, Spectrum 13 news reporter in Florida, uh, shot and killed at a crime scene this weekend, um, this week. A nine-year-old girl also died. Those are two bright lives. Uh, and I have to note that I speak just the day after NPR announced uh, a 10% reduction in force. And I think we all understand the vagaries of the news business, and we understand and respect the fact that it is a business. But I want to accept this award in honor of those who have given so much of themselves to make those initials, NPR, stand for something that nourishes millions of Americans every day. And to those of you all around this country who support us, your encouragement has never been more vital. I was reading, uh, rereading a memoir recently by Christopher Usherwood who said, I am a collaboration, and I certainly feel that tonight. A highly incomplete list of people who gave me so much of themselves and who I have to thank uh, include Jay Kernis, still my partner in crime at CBS, Robert Siegel, Cindy Carpey, and Ken Hom, Peter Breslow, and Sarah Lucy Oliver, who is here tonight, our producer. No doubt thinking, don't go on too long. <laughs> we have a deadline tomorrow. <laughs> I've had especially close relationships with, with audio artists who've recorded my voice all over the world. Uh, Claude Cunningham and Rich Rary, Michael Schweppe, Leo de Laguila, Manolita Weatherell, Burke Hun, Stu Rushfield, and many more. My mother, my father, my stepfather, I want to thank my agent, <laughs> Wayne Kaback. He represents a lot of people who bring in a lot more. Uh, but he's been unstinting in his attention and friendship and made it possible for me to do work I love for a family that's taught me the meaning of love. My wife, Caroline, who is here tonight, and our daughters, Elise and Paulina, who are very happy not to be here. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not the other guest speaking, it was me that I think they dreaded. Um, and I want to hold a thought tonight for thousands of people in war zones and inner cities and small towns all over the world who've let me into their lives, often into their lowest moments, to ask painful questions. Thank you for that. Please let me just take a little bit more of your time to share something from my lifetime perspective now that you've all done the math and know exactly how old I am, goddammit. Um, <laughs> there is no safe space in journalism. What we do should come with a caution, warning. What you're about to see or hear or read may contain language, ideas, arguments that you may find alarming, offensive, and upsetting to your view of the world. That is journalism. Now, I've been in societies in which the press is repressed, hounded, locked up, and thrown through windows. And as we've just been so infortuitously reminded, we, we face occasional threats here. But mostly we face occasional lawsuits and obnoxious tweets. We receive awards from each other while reporters in Mexico, Russia, Cuba, China, Iran, the Philippines, Ethiopia, and other societies have to live in fear. Our problems are different and many of our own invention. 
We have often used the power of the web to connect us to the world then closed ourselves off from different points of view. We are beginning to take the technology of mass media to carve out niches and echo chambers, rather than trying to reach across divides to people of all backgrounds and beliefs. People can now choose the news they want, or it's chosen for them, click by click, so millions of good and conscientious Americans can now fill themselves with only the news that nourishes the views they already hold. And many news enterprises have followed, identifying an audience by algorithms and repeating the same themes, like refrain, story after story. And we've too often allowed ourselves to identify our audience by our most superficial qualities. It's one of the bromides of this business that journalism should speak truth to power. But more and more, I fear we are happy just to speak to ourselves and to like-minded individuals, report after report, tweet after tweet. The whole premise of reporting is to tell stories of people whom we may think we have nothing in common because if the story is well and truly told, we will discover that in fact we have a lot in common. We're not talking enough to people, we're talking to pundits and to each other and to people with titles, often long ones that disclose by themselves what they're going to say. But we're often not allowing ourselves or our audience to be surprised by real people and their complexities and contradictions. And too often, I think we speak in cliches, hyphenated, dialectical, academic, activist, ideological, corporate catchphrase, cut and paste jargon instead of real language that can be vivid and open to all. It's not lost on me that the dispatches of Orwell, Hemingway, Martha Gellhorn, Ben Heck, Stanley Crouch, Joan Didion, and Edward R. Murrow are read in perpetuity because they were lyricists, not polemicists. All of us in this room tonight, I think, have to worry about how artificial intelligence bots might soon replace us. When we do work that is algorithmic, unsurprising, predictable, polemical, and formularic, we make ourselves pretty easy to replace. Look, I hope these remarks might apply to all of us in this business, but not equally. And speaking this week, I have to be specific. I was disgusted these past few days to read the messages that show Fox News executives and hosts consciously reported lies about the legitimacy of the 2020 election because they were sure that's what their audience wanted to hear. They were not even sincere in their fallacies. They had not only a chance, but a duty to help their audience through chaos and confusion. But instead, Fox hosts and executives chose stock price. They shouted fire in the crowded halls of Congress. I think there are a few of us tonight who might have made reference to Chicago. I do believe there's no better place for a reporter to learn about courts and crime and human drama, ethnic strife, race, greatness, art, comedy, loss, life, politics, and the music of the soul. Uh, you know, my, my wife, Caroline, is French. There are times even she is convinced that one of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not put ketchup on a hot dog. And that the rallying cry of the French Revolution was liberté, equality, and vote early and often. <laughs> but in fact, the motto of Chicago journalism, which comes from the columnist Peter Pin uh, Finley Peter Dunn, is that our work should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. In these times, I think this means challenging the comfortable notions and nostrums our audiences may have about the world left, right, and center. And I count among my bl many blessings in life to work for NPR, which has not only a business plan, but a purpose. There's a speech in Hector MacArthur's play, The Front Page, that's set in the Chicago criminal courts in which a character, I, 
There was a revival about three years ago. John Slattery played the part of Hildy Johnson. I like to think now that my hair is silver, that someone would consider me too, but <laughs> Hildy Johnson has a speech where he says, journalists, peeping through keyholes, running after fire engines like a lot of dogs waking up people in the middle of the night to ask them for pictures of their dead loved ones or what they think of Mussolini. A lot of Daffy Budinskis running around with holes in their pants and for what? So a million office workers and motormen and their wives can think they know what's going on? You know, that sounds like a good life to me. <laughs> this is a tough business, it should be. We put a hand on events that can affect elections, human reputations, life and death. That journalism is the profession of the front page, not Mary Poppins. It should be done with decency. But our rumpled forebears in this business were among the deplorables of their times. Obnoxious, rowdy, often vulgar, boorish, and worse, clannish, blinkered, barely civil, and sometimes even hateful. But they opened news to the public, independent of party, lobby, or faction. They told stories about murders, riots, wars, crimes, bribes, revolutions, nonsense, and inanities, because that is all part of our human story. We're here to comfort, but not coddle. Explore and surprise, not scold. Joke, but not mock. And to share some of the sheer fun we have in learning about our world in all of its ludicrous and captivating contradictions. Thanks for listening. There's more to come. Thank you, Scott. We would like to invite everyone to join us at the political after party right outside the ballroom in the foyer, and we'd like to invite you to come back next year, and thank you again. Good evening.